welcome back to our study on lessons of money as this has been a study into faith promise offering or giving we've been doing the Liberty Bible course I'll give you the name information website at the end of this uh, YouTube video for you listening to it audio if you go to my YouTube account you can watch me in black and white See who I am, watch me read, watch me open up the Bible. We've been dealing with a very serious matter here that even I was misled for a while. Thank God for the mercy of God that I'm out. Save, know the Lord, and Lord working with me. We have done misquoting scriptures you need to go back and read those go back and listen and watch those we got into misleading statements we left off last week with God being no one and that angered me that upset me even my wife told me today we're going to be doing this study it's like yeah why well you didn't sound like you were done and I was done with this idiot and this program we're not done with the lesson and we're taking this out of the Liberty Bible book this is not my saying that you watch these videos where I've added my own two cents in there I've told you well let's get right into it because I want to get the next two misleading statements misleading statement number three <clears throat> strongly insinuating that promises made to God are not as biting, binding, excuse me, as promises made to man. Man, I should be giving you the page numbers on these. We're on page 16 of the book, uh, Money Part 2, Practical Christian Living, book number 5, page 16. I didn't even think about doing that just to now. So you can follow along. Get the books. And you send the books to them after you fill out the spaces. They'll go through the spaces and send it back to you and give you a nice little uh, certificate that you can keep and say, listen, I went through this and I've been rewarded for my labor. By the way, if you got an NIV, New King James, or any of those other garbage ones, Play Indian. Go out in your backyard, start a fire, and just light that fire with those Bibles, and hoot around and shout around, and get yourself a King James Bible. Because if you ain't got a King James Bible, you are wrong. As wrong can be. That's another study. Strongly insinuating that promises made to God are not as biting as promises made to man. And you... Listen to last week's. If you want to see firecrackers on the 4th of, well, July something. It wasn't the 4th, but it was fireworks. Listen to Oswald, O-S-W-A-L-D, J. Smith's, S-M-I-T-H, statement again. And I'm quoting. I do not believe in pledges. I have never taken up a pledge offering in my life. What is the difference, you ask, between a pledge offering and a faith promise offering? All the difference in the world. A pledge offering is between you and a church. Between you and and a missionary society and someday the deacons may come along and try to collect it or you may receive a letter asking for it yeah I like to no, 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 stick with the quote going back to quoting in other words we're quoting you can be held responsible for a pledge offering a faith promise offering, on the other hand, 
It's between you and God. No one will ever ask you for it. No official will ever call on you to collect it. No one will ever send you a letter reminding you to do it. It is a promise made by you to God and to God alone. If you are unable to pay it, all you have to do is tell God. God, uh, excuse me, give him your excuse. And if he accepts it, you are free. You do not have to pay it. That, I say, is a faith promise offering, period, end of quote. Now let's take his illustration of his definition here. And let's go one step more. A man goes out, a born-again Christian, loves the Lord, wants to do right, goes out and pays for a woman for the night. Next morning, God, I'm sorry, take my excuse. Thank you very much. Now, doesn't that sound stupid? Oswald J. Smith says that between the two systems, there is all the difference in the world. The difference that he strongly emphasized, emphasizes is the part about being held responsible for, contempt, for com ugh, com commitments made to man, but definitely minimizes that aspect in relation to making a co commitment to God. Let me put it down like this. Let me give you a little warning wherever you go. If you make a pledge, you are liable under the law to make that pledge right, even if you can't. Under law. Don't go crying after you made a pledge and they come to your house and they want you to do. You have to by the law. That is the law. Now is it true that we should be more fearful of man or of God? Period. Doesn't Jesus say that we ought to fear God and not man? who has control over our soul, that God can throw a man's soul into hell where man can just kill us? If somebody came into this house right now and killed me, I go to heaven. My body goes to the grave. I go to heaven because I'm right with God. But if I die lost, unsaved, not only is my body dead, but God can cast me into the hell, the lake of fire. Uh, David said, let me fall in the hands of God, for God is merciful and man is not. Book of Proverbs, fear the Lord, the fear of the Lord. Take your Bibles to Luke chapter 12, verse 4. So we have a pledge and man. And we have a promise and God. You need to go back and watch all these videos. If you do not watch all these videos, then you are in the wrong. Don't take what something I said now and not listening to the whole thing that's out of content Luke 12 4 and 5 and I say unto you my friends hey, exactly what I was just saying be not afraid of them that killed the body. 
and after that have no more that they can do. No one can put my soul and later my body anywhere but where God has put my body and my soul. Saved or lost. I'm saved. You cannot throw my body and soul into hell. No matter what you believe. If a man is lost, you cannot get his body and soul into heaven no matter what you believe. But I will forewarn you whom ye shall fear. Now this is who Jesus says. If you've got a red letter Bible, this is in red. This is Jesus speaking. Unless you're a Jehovah Witness nuthead, you don't believe Jesus Christ is God, so you're not going to listen. So just shut up. You don't know what you're talking about. Jesus speaking. Fear him, which after he has killed, has power to cast into hell. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. That's God. But Mr. Smith tells us we're to fear man and pledge more than we're to fear God and a promise. Malachi chapter 1 verse 6. You get to Matthew, just go left. Last book in the Old Testament, just before Matthew. We're looking at who are we to fear. In Malachi 1 6, a son honoreth his father, which is proper. That's an Old Testament law that even Paul writes to the Christian. Children, obey your parents. Honor thy father and thy mother. A servant and his master. That's in the law, and that's also in Paul. That's proper. If then I, God speaking, be a father, these people, you know, you ask them, Father, 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 Father. God's saying, where's my honor? And if I be a master, and he is, where is my fear? Say if the Lord of hosts unto you. Verse 8. If ye offer the blind for sacrifice, is it not evil? And if ye offer the lame and sick, is it not evil? Offer it now unto thy governor. Will he be pleased with thee? Or accept thy person? Saith the Lord of hosts. You give me the wretched. You give me the, 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 the ill, the sick, the rottenness. See if your governor will accept that. You don't give it to him. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verses 4 and 5. We're looking at man and we're looking at God. Somebody says you're to fear man more than you are to fear God. I'm going to say this, like I, I've said this off and on, and it's getting tiring. Do we need to go any further? When your church has the faith promise the next time, are you going to take part in it, or do we have to go even further? It's only going to get uglier. Most men will get ugly. We're on page 17, and we got we got 17 more pages to do. We're not going to do them all tonight. 
Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verses 4 and 5. When thou vowest a vow unto God, do you take this woman to be your lawfully wedded wife? I do. Do you take this man to be your lawfully wedded, I mean lawfully wedded husband? I do. You're standing before God. I'm talking to Christians now. I ain't talking to I'm talking to born again Christians stand before their pastor, their church. And you make a vow to God. Or do you? Are you vowing to God or are you vowing to just that man in, in the suit? Do you even think about God when you make that commitment to that man or to that woman? God just God just laid this on my head. He laid it on my heart. Maybe there's Christians out there who are not thinking marriage is to God, but maybe fear of man. Wow, that's something that's something amazing. This is one of these moments that God just threw a big wow in my heart. And I don't know what to say. Yep, believe it or not, write this down. January 23rd, 2013, 7.12 p.m. Stiley is speechless. It's July. It's July. I don't know why we keep saying January. I did that yesterday, too. I don't even know. Let's, let's get back with the verse. I, I, that's, that just threw me. When thou vows a vow unto God, and defer not to pay it. For he has no pleasure in fools. So if you're going to vow to God and not do it, God calls you foolish. Read the book of Proverbs, please. And mark every place where it says fool. You fool. Pay that which thou hast vowed. Better is it that thou shouldest not vow then that should is vow and not pay now well the statement that we read from mr. Smith is a pledge is more honoring than a promise I would probably assume and I'm assuming here that you know promise doesn't match a vow because you can go to God and say you know this is my excuse and They'll accept it or not, and be, be bygones by bygones. But we're not looking at promise. We're not looking at pledge. We're looking at God and man. And whenever you're going to tell God you're going to do something, you are to do it, or you better not open your big, fat, lolling trap. Men on the battlefield. Lord, if you get me out of that blank, 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 fill in the blanks, whatever you did, and then you don't do it, you are a fool. Going back to the marriage then, Lord, you know, I do. You don't. You are a fool. You go up before the church, you just had a baby, you dedicate that baby to the Lord, you're going to live your life and dedicate that child to God and bring that child up in a Christian house and you fall away from church, go back in your sins and all that, you are a fool. Chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. Keep thy foot when thou goest to the house of God. And be more ready to hear then to give the sacrifice of fools. Now, where did the fool match in verses 4 and 5? Somebody open up their big fat. Keep your foot. What's that mean? Don't open your mouth where your foot can go in. You just might have found out you stepped in dog crap. You didn't need to say Yes, I needed to say that. You know, there's nothing just putting your foot in your mouth. But if you got crap in the bottom of your shoe, you don't want to do that. You do know a dog's unclean. For they consider not that they do evil. There are some people who just say, hey, God, I'll do this, and, you know, fingers crossed, and I'm not going to do it, and they don't even realize it's evil. Did you get that? Are you listening to me? 
Have you made a vow before God at an altar, at a, 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 at a marriage, at a battlefield, or something in your life that you had trouble? Did you make something to God and say, God, and you have not fulfilled that? God said that's evil. You need to read 1 John verses 1 and 9. You need to repent and get it right before the Lord calls you home or before he calls his entire church home. I didn't know. Ignorance is not bliss with God. You can't. Listen, I'm going to tell you right now. God does not take excuses, but this guy says he does. I know he doesn't. Be not rash with thy mouth. You know how quick a rash spreads. Let not thy heart be hasty to utter anything before God. For God is in heaven and thou upon earth. Therefore let thy words be few. And what he's talking about, he's making a vow. He's making an offering. He's making a promise. Making a pledge. Man. To the holy God in heaven. A little speck of what we are down here. Matthew 12, 36 and 37. Now what we've been talking about is we've been talking about what we've been saying to God. And not doing what we said to God. And it has been evil, it has been foolish, and God will require of it. Just because you say, I had my fingers tied, or it didn't work out, or I was, wasn't was really kidding, I didn't know what I was saying, it was at the, the speed of the moment, whatever excuse you can do, God will not take it, it is evil, it needs to be put under the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Evil. Let's call it what it is. We got preachers out there saying, you know, shack up is fornication and affair is an adultery and a gay person is a sodomite. But if you say something, it is really, you know, it's an excuse. No, it's evil. And this mess is being preached and taught out of pulpits every year. And when you lose your job or whatever thing happens, you just tell God the excuse. Excuse. It don't even tell you to put it under the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. So you think if I just give God an excuse, I'm sorry, it's done and gone with. You wait till you get to the judgment seat of Christ. Well, why is it there? Because they didn't tell you to put it under the blood. You are not be doing things like this. Because you don't know what's going to happen a minute from now. You don't know what's going to happen ten minutes from now. You don't know what's going to happen tonight, or tomorrow, or next week, or next month, or next year, or next decade. You have no idea. You could be the president of a big corporation... And that corporation can fall overnight. Matthew 12, 36 and 37. But I say unto you. I try to memorize this scripture. Pray for me. I, I can never remember where it is. I need to know where this one is. That every idle word. Oh, check out the legs on her. Hey, did you hear the joke about... Yeah, maybe I'll call out sick this week because I can go over there. Hey, did you see the game the other day? Did you see what he... I mean, that was a good... I'm so sick and tired of this job. I wish that preacher would shut up. He's been going on a long time. Money, money, money. That's all he preaches about. Money, money, money. I hate that guy over there. 
That's idle words. They don't need to be said. I'm trying to help you out the judgment seat of Christ. I'm trying to get you to you to confess your sins and not do them no more. And when you do, confess and put them under the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. So when you stand at the judgment seat of Christ, you be clean and get rewards. You know what your common person that's going to be in these churches are today? You know what they're going to be standing at the judgment seat of Christ? It's going to be a lot of ashes and a lot of smoke because that preacher does not preach and tell them the truth. They talk about the biggie, biggie sins. Because they know they ain't going to hit a lot of people in their congregation. How about your big mouth? That every idle word that man shall speak, they, man, shall give an account. Thereof in the day of judgment, either or, saved or lost. God is going to hold you accountable for every single word that's not under the blood. How's that? From the time that you first spoke to the time that you take your last breath, whatever is not under the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ is going to be held out in front of your church members, in front of your family, before Jesus Christ, before your co work before everybody that you know that's saved, if you're saved. That includes if you make a promise or a pledge. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. The Bible clearly warns us to be very careful to fear God above anyone. And to be very careful as to the words that we utter before him. That is the exact opposite of what faith promise giving system teaches. It teaches that a pledge it teaches that pledges to men are more fearful than the commandments of God. God may hold you accountable if you don't put it under the blood. How's that one? But I lost my job or what? Uh-huh. Uh you didn't see it coming, did you? God did. Number four. Try to get this one in. Saying the misleading statement number four. Number four? Shouldn't we have just stopped at number one? We've done misapplication of scriptures. I don't even remember how many it was in that one. This is even number one. There was a list here, but if you go in the book, you can find mis misapplication of scriptures, three or four of them. Now we're on statement misleading statement number four. There we go. I don't know why we gotta go any further, but we're going to. Saying that a faith promise offering is not a commitment to a local church, but only to God. Consider Oswald J. Smith's statement again. I'm going to quote. A pledge offering is between you and a church. I'm quoting. Quoting. A faith promise. Excuse me. Let me quote again. A pledge offering is between you and a church, between you and a missionary society, and someday the deacons may come along and try to collect it, or you may receive a letter asking for it. In other words, you can be held responsible for a pledge offering. A faith promise offering, on the other hand, is between you and God.
Turn your Bibles to First Chronicles 21. If these faith promises are not pledges, because they say a pledge is horizontal, i.e. made to a church, then why do the churches who practice faith promise giving record the pledges? What could possibly be the purpose of having people fill out a card as to how much they are promising to give to God? If it is only between God and the person, not between the person and the church, then why does the church need to know the amount? There are only two possible answers for that. He said you know, it's, it's, it's not to the local church, but only God knows. So when you fill out the card, you don't put your name. You just put how much you're going to give. Why do you need the card for it? The first possibility is that the church just wants to boast over the amount that, is, that its people promised to give to God. We had 45 people in the Sunday school this morning, 36 in the church service, 18 in the nursery. We had five women out in the foyer talking about three people that were in the church and one that was homesick. And we had two piano players. And then we had three people came to the fellowship dinner. With, with 15 people came and played bingo. And five people are annoying me because they're trying to tell me I'm doing wrong. Preacher goes out. He goes with other preachers sitting at the table. My people gave twelve thousand dollars this year. Would you give? You gave thirteen thousand. Well, next year we'll do fourteen thousand, and we'll beat your church. We'll only do it with twelve people. That's what's going on. I've got a question. Can I ask a question before we go to the next one, please? Please, please call me. Ask me a question. If no one puts their name on the card, yeah, here's my question. How do you know the preacher said that 10,000 was given as a pledge or a promise, whatever it is? How do you know that number's right? And what happens at the end of the year when 15 people dropped out and went to God and said, God, I'm sorry, uh, didn't do it. They don't ask. I left the church with faith promise involved and they didn't even ask me how much I, I, I promised to give. If I, I didn't give nothing, but how many people left the church saying, well, I'll give a certain amount and they're still taking out the offering, singing that, you know? Have a good day. Although this may sound foolish to an average church member, that is exactly what often happens in, com in conversations that pastors have with one another. Amongst pastors is a very, uh, sometimes quite a matter of boasting as to the size of their faith promise giving. Because you do know if your church is involved in faith promising giving, and they're not an independent fundamentalist church. Now all the church in his group are involved in faith promising. And they're all about chit-chat like a bunch of women in the nursery of a Baptist church. This is a subtle, subtle, like Genesis 3, and sometimes not so subtle way of pastors try to show other pastors that the blessing of God is upon their ministry. Sometimes faith promises so the pastor can boast. I hope you got First Chronicles 21. Let me quote something for you, okay? About that, what I just said. This is a quote for the pastors that go out and, and brag about what you're doing. They're bragging about what you're doing, not what they're doing. Because you don't know how much he gives or how much he promised because there's no names. So here's my quote. <laughs> Let 
That's to you, 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 and everybody else involved. That if you don't do it, then don't take that. Wipe off your screen and chuckle along. David made a mistake in getting puffed up over numbers. First Chronicles 21, 1 through 4, then 7 through 8. And Satan stood up against Israel. Uh oh. Satan's in the church house. He's making a list and checking it twice to see who promised or not. Faith promise is coming to town. He knows if you didn't fill that pledge card out. He knows if you cannot give. Satan stood up against Israel to provoke David to number Israel. Are you a number to your pastor? Listen, I've been at a fellowship, and to find out that we were counted at the at the guy's fellowship at his house. He just had us there so he could say, oh, at our Christmas party, we had 45. How many did you have at yours? Well, we don't have it because we don't celebrate Christmas. Shame on you! Shame on you! It's not about the birthday of Jesus. Now, everybody all together, bring your birthday presents to Jesus. Let's sing happy birthday to Jesus. Even though December 25th is not his birthday, we still go to sing happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. One, two, three, four, five. We got 35 that came to our party. And David said to Joab and to the rulers of the people, Go! Number Israel from Beersheba, even the day. Ushers, number the people that come through the front door and the back door. Count them. And bring the number to, to them to me. When you're done counting the people that came through the doors, come to me, the pastor, and tell me how much. How much is that Christian in the window? Or, or, I really like to boast the more. And Joab answered, now here's a, Joab's wife, the Lord make his people a hundred times so many more as they be. But my Lord the king, are they not all my Lord's servants? Don't they love the Lord? Don't they believe in the Lord Jesus Christ? I don't care. Count them. What if they're not saved? Count them still. Count them once. Count them twice. If you don't, you're going to be held accountable for not counting why then does my Lord require this thing? Why will he be a cause for trespass Israel? Um, I'm getting sorry. I'm getting... Nevertheless, the king's word prevailed against Joab. And God was displeased. Oh, with this thing. What's the thing? Counting. And they've got some excuse. Therefore, he smote Israel. Oh, can I say it? Please, can I say it? Does your church have problems? Do they have people that are sick? Are they ending up in the hospital? Are they not doing anything for Jesus Christ and not suffering persecution as they live for Jesus Christ? As Paul said, yea, all they that will live godly shall suffer persecution. But they're not living godly, and they're, but yet they're suffering persecution. And the fact is maybe because you're counting in people? Pastor, you may be the trouble with going on with your church. What are you going to do about it? You proclaim to be a man of God. How much of a man of God are you? Are you of Christ or are you of Satan? I preach the truth. God was displeased with this thing, therefore he smote Israel. And David said unto God, I have sinned greatly. I hope the preachers say I have sinned greatly. Because I have done, how come you, 
Because I have done this thing, but now I beseech thee, do away the iniquity of thy servant, for I have done very foolishly. What was it about a fool back here in, in Nicolaus? He said he tells God, "I'm going to do something." He doesn't do it, and God calls him a fool. He calls it a sacrifice of fools if you open up your big fat mouth. You know, all preachers are foolish because we talk too much. Some of us put our souls in our mouth through the Lord Jesus Christ. Some of you guys put your feet in your mouth, your soul. Although a lot of boasting is done as a result of tallying up the total from faith promise giving, there's another factor that is even worse. All right, let's close up. Close up and I make you wonder. No, I'd be cruel. You want to buy now to say that this is wicked? What on earth is this? This thing that this, uh, Brother Hayward has been quoting from a book. I've been reading his scriptures. I've been telling you. Now I know it. This ain't going to happen. Because people are going to listen to this, and they're not going to listen because they're going to do what they're going to do, besides the fact whatever God has to say. But wouldn't it be great that it, the next time your church has this event, and nobody takes part in it? I would even laugh if somebody, maybe a couple of people, took, took this book about faith promise and threw it in a plate instead of their, their card. Say, hey, Pastor, read this. It ain't about Brother Hayward. It ain't about me as your church member. It's about Liberty Bible Course. All right, let's get on. It's a plain dishonest to say faith promise giving is not a commitment to a local church, as opposed to saying it is only a commitment to God. Because in truth, it is. And every pastor knows it. Local churches depend upon those figures to plan their budgets. Whether for faith promise missions or faith promise building programs. So in fact, the local church is dependent upon those offerings that we see. We're going to give as a church all the cards that came in. We're going to give $1,000 to the mission program. That $1,000 is put in the budget. We're going to faith promise give uh, two thousand dollars this year for the building project. Well, two thousand dollars has been given, put in a budget for the building, and the church, not God, depend, the, the demands and depends on you giving that money that you said you would give. I promise. Now, how about this? Plead the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Walk up to your pastor and say, Pastor, I can't do it because I lost my work uh, and I, I don't have enough money to, to do it. Uh, I'm very sorry. Do you, set my, do you set me free? What will he say? <laughs> what would he say? Is he as forgiving as God? You mean I gotta go to the pastor's conference and tell my lost five people for a long time? I gotta tell the lost five people. They're not gonna be happy with me. Many churches only take on new missions after their faith promise mission conference each year. Why at that time? Because they wait to see how much money the people promise to give. And they take on missionaries according to the end amount. Whoa! That's why they want you to give more each and every time. We got 120 people that give the faith missions. Now we support 200 missionaries. Now it's all about numbers. And who cares if missionaries don't do nothing for God but play Tilly Winks and... and Barefoot in the park and all kinds of junk. 
But we support missionaries. Get on. Why play games that the pledges are not being made to the local church? They are. In fact, if a church member moves during the process of the year, oh, my question's being answered. He is encouraged to still send his faith promise offering back to the local church where he made such a promise. I live down in Florida. We have a bunch of people come down here called snowbirds. They come down here and then we get involved in this faith promise. And I guarantee the pastor before they go back home for their, make sure you send your faith promise that you offered. I was even asked when I left my church if I was given the faith promise offering. According to that statement, I left my church because of doctrinal statements. They against the doctrine of, of the Bible. They still expect me if I had to say I had a faith promise to send them a check. On missionaries, I don't even think are approved of God. Which is more to sin? If the promise was made only to God, then it would not matter at all what the local church has the money been given to. It would still go to God, wouldn't it? What if I took, if I moved to another church, I put an envelope that faith promise ten dollars will go to the missionaries of this church. It's between me and God. But see, the other church can't brag about it. And the new church doesn't know what I'm doing. How about you just say, when you do your bills, whether it's monthly, weekly, bi-weekly, I say, all right, you do your bill, um, Lord, I'm gonna, I can give you $20 this week. That's going to be a little hard, Lord, but $20, that's all I got this week. I can, besides my tithes and offers, that's $20 for the missionary or, or the building program. That's all I can do, Lord. I'm sorry. Here's a check for it. And you do your bills the next week, and you know, maybe something's come in that you didn't expect, or registration, or insurance, that you know, you know. All right, I can't get nothing this week. I mean, $2, that, that, that's it. That's all I can give. God would rather have the $2 of all you can give than say, Lord, I'm going to give you $20 next week and not have it. In spirit and in truth, local churches collect pledge cards, faith promise cards, because they are dependent upon that money and those co commitments made. There is something wrong with the way of raising money when you have to be deceitful to do it. Faith promise giving has all kinds of deceit that commonly goes along with it. The church leaders know it. Why is it used then? Because it raises so much money. Listen to Oswald J. Smith again, quote, I would never go back to cash offering. With a cash offering, I could no, I, I'm going to try this again, quote, I would never go back to cash offering. With a cash offering, I could only get a very little. But with faith promise offering, I can get much. End of quote. A faith Promise Offering by Oswald J. Smith. And today you can do it with PayPal. You can have it all magically taken out of your check. Your account. Next week, Lord willing, misleading statement number five, I promise you, and if I can't deliver it to you, I'll have to tell God I can't do it, God, because I didn't have it. Listen, I'm not speaking out from a monkey tree here. I lived and went through this event in a Baptist church. And I got followed up in a deception too. And I went through the 365 days. Thank God that God didn't put me in a spot and knows my heart.
But you know with that faith promise money that I put in there, you ever have to pray before you put that check in there, Lord God, there's some, I don't believe, or, that, that this money does not go to them? And I said, we're going to close now. You need to listen to all these videos, all the audio. All. Not just what you like. May God bless you. First John 1 John 1.9. Remember that.